Merry Christmas, everyone. Can I ask that you just uh, pack in a little bit? Uh, we had the same good problem as yesterday. <laughs> so if you can squeeze in a little bit, just in case you're still a uh, few latecomers who are making their way in, we want to make room for them as uh, we want to make room for Jesus in our lives. Good morning to those of you uh, worshipping with us online as well. Merry Christmas. A blessed Christmas to, to you as well. Uh, recently, I'm watching this uh, Netflix show. It's called All the Light We Cannot See. Anybody watch it already? A few hands, uh, not many. So you don't know the plot and I shan't spoil the plot for you. Now, it's a screen adaptation of the novel of the same name by Anthony Dower. And I must confess, I haven't read the book. I'm merely watching this screen adaptation. Now, this book apparently won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction as well as the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. So it looks like this book is quite worth reading one day. Now, the story of this book is set in the context of World War II, where some French citizens, they have put up a resistance against the German Nazis. And so they were communicating the secret, you know, against the German forces. So that's the general setting. I shan't spoil the show for you, but I want to share a quote which jumped out at me as I watched uh, this series. Although this quote has its own context in the show, I want to appropriate it for today's sermon. Huh? So I take it out of context, but I thought this quote is wonderful for us as he sets the context for our sermon this morning as well. And the quote is this, The most important light is the light you cannot see. Huh? <laughs> I thought light must be seen, right? But the most important light is the light you cannot see. That's the quote that comes uh, from this book. Why do I say that? You will see it in a short while. So yesterday, Pastor Emmanuel preached uh, from the New Testament, the proclamation of the angels, the good news to the shepherds. Today, I thought, uh, since I've been sent by all of you graciously for my studies in the Old Testament, I want to share an Old Testament proclamation, but from a very familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 9. And we see how God's light comes into a darkened world. We talk about lighting all these uh, candles, right? The heaven candles, and today lighting the Christ candle. So we focus on how the light of the world, Jesus, comes into our world. From where we stand in today in history, it is the most important light we can no longer see. Right? None of us can see Jesus anymore in the flesh. Yet, Jesus is all the light we and anyone will ever need for all of eternity. So why do I say that Jesus is all the light we need, which is a sermon title for today? We'll find out as we walk through Isaiah chapter 9. Reading from verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali. But in the future, he will honour Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Median's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. And then the famous verses we often like to quote, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Come, let us pray. <coughs> Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this glorious passage. This glorious passage of proclamation of good news to prophet Isaiah. O Holy Spirit, shine the light of Jesus Christ into all our hearts today. Shine your light into our darkness. Whatever our situations may be, we invite you, Lord Jesus, to come in and bring hope, restoration, and salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So like much, how, how, much, uh, like how much of the world, uh, Europe and the world, were plunged into deep darkness during World War II, the people that Isaiah preached to, they were also plunged into deep darkness. In 733 BC, before Christ, God allowed this nation called Assyria to invade the north of Israel due to their idolatry and sin. This passage is found in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. 
And it says, in the time of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath, Pileser, king of Assyria came and then he took all these cities and it says, including the land of Naphtali and deported the people to Assyria. And so the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali were the first to be hit by the Assyrian Empire. By 721 BC, the Assyrian Empire would totally exile all the 10 northern Israel tribes. Now the word here used in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 that word deep darkness, those, that phrase deep darkness, is actually the same word used in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That valley of the shadow of death, it's the same word used here in verse 2. So we're talking about death's dark shadow here. Very dark days. When, why do I say these are very dark days in those, in those days? <clears throat> the Assyrians were very cruel people. They would cut off the limbs of people when they captured them, they would gorge out their eyes and then leave them to wander in the streets, to roam around as a visible sign of the power of the Assyrian Empire. And they loved to impale their victims on large sticks. The stick, the, the stick would be driven un, into the body under the ribs. And uh, how do we know this? Historians, thankfully, have the evidence from their own uh, uh, pride. <laughs> They recorded this on stone tablets and then we got pictures of this. <clears throat> and so the victim's weight will cause the spikes to protrude slowly but deeper and deeper into them. And that kind of slow death was terrifying. Later on, the Romans made it even worse. They adapted it and made it even more cruel. It eventually led to the crucifixion. <clears throat> and this is why one of the reasons why the prophet, I believe the main reason why the prophet Jonah refused to preach the call of repentance to the Ninevites, imagine this. He had seen his own people walking around without limbs, right? Their eyes got out, people being impaled on sticks. And now God tells him, Jonah, you go and preach the gospel to the Ninevites. His response is, no, why should I? These people are so cruel. And because he knows the forgiveness, the great grace of God, he says, I will not go. It's not because God, uh, Jonah was scared of God. That's why he ran away. No, it's precisely the opposite. Because he knows of the great grace of God, he does not want his enemies to be forgiven and that's why Jonah ran away from the call of God. The verse, uh, verse 4 in Isaiah 9 uses imagery in three different forms to emphasize the intensity of the cruelty and the intensity of the cruelty of oppression dealt by the Assyrians. He says there's a yoke of burden, a bar across our shoulders and a rod pressing on us. Typically in Hebrew uh, poetic literature, they just use two phrases, right? A and B. But when it's the third one, usually it's emphasized a, a, a point even more. And so it really emphasizes from a poetic angle the kind of cruelty and the oppression dealt by the Assyrians. Now, isn't that what deep darkness feels like in our day? Of course, none of us would dare to say our uh, suffering is worse than the, the, the Israelites, right? When they were attacked by the Assyrians. None of us were impaled on sticks like that, as you can see in the picture, but certainly we all have our own dark days. And when we are being attacked, when we are being crushed, it feels like that too. We feel this rod upon our shoulders, this burden on our shoulders, we can hardly move. We feel our life sucked away from us. Looking beyond ourselves, many parts of our world today continue to live in this kind of dark days, senseless violence and war. We think immediately of Israel, Gaza, the kind of images we see on the news. We think of Russia, Ukraine. How did they war? this war begin in the first place? Senseless violence. Sending troops of people just to their death. We think of the, the Rohingyas in Myanmar. We think of the tensions between North and South Korea and US. And so our world continues to live in dark days. Not to mention even those countries not at war. Inflation. Argentina, for example, the prices for them have skyrocketed, the people are suffering. But here's the good news. It has been good news and will continue to be good news. That light has dawned. Light has dawned. The deep darkness shall be dispelled. From where Isaiah was standing, his prophecy was in the future. But he wrote it in such a way in the Hebrew text that it's a sense of prophetic perfect. In the, in the, this means the promise of deliverance and hope is so certain, it will surely come to pass. Even though it's in the future, but Isaiah was so confident when he wrote it that God is faithful and this promise will surely come to pass. And indeed, it has come to pass, especially for us as Christians, because this light is Jesus. Jesus has come into our darkness. He is the light we and everyone else will ever need for all of eternity. 
Listen again as Isaiah declares this great news. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So the scripture text first of all says, Jesus, chosen Messiah, the chosen one, will bear our burdens on his shoulders, meaning he assumes his role as king of the kingdom. The NIV uses the word government. Somehow we misread it sometimes to think that the government will be pursuing him, but actually what he's trying to say is that he assumes his role as the king of the kingdom. The Hebrew word is less technical than government. It simply means to rule, to, uh, to have authority, to have dominion. And now let me share another quote from this same book, uh, All the Light We Cannot See. And so they were running away from the Nazis when they first uh, invaded Paris. And the blind daughter, she carries with her this all-important radio. In those days, radio is the main form of communication. But there was especially this frequency, radio frequency that was very important that she would tune into every night. And the father asked, hey, we're escaping, we're trying to run for our lives. Why are you bringing along this radio? It's burdening us. It's going to slow us down from our, in our escape. But she explained the story, so and so forth. Finally, after listening to his daughter, the father said, it's not your burden to carry alone. It's not your burden to carry alone. And so he took it and moved, carried out the burden <laughs> as a loving father would. So likewise, Jesus helps us carry our burdens, the burdens of the entire world on his shoulders. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to learn to surrender our yokes and burdens to the Lord and let him be king over our situations. I think we all know this, that the government or the king or the ruling party, whoever is in control, can impact an entire nation, right? <laughs> Most of us adults here, we know this to be true. Whoever is ruling can impact an entire nation. As Singaporeans, I think we are really blessed compared to many parts of the world due to the governance of a very peaceful country. For many other countries, they face corruption, betrayal, violence, scheming politics, racial religious discrimination, might is right, so and so forth. So many wrong values. But the good news is as kingdom people, God's kingdom is established and upheld on justice and righteousness. If you want to learn more about justice and righteousness, I invite you to listen uh, to QC sermon a few weeks ago on biblical justice and righteousness. So first, Jesus bears on him that burden of leadership. We are subjects of his kingdom. Next, Isaiah uses several titles or names to describe this chosen messianic ruler. Some scholars believe the four titles here originally referred to King Hezekiah who defended against the Assyrians successfully. So there was some success under King Hezekiah. And so while it is possible, if you understand the book of Isaiah, for example, <clears throat> many scholars see that Isaiah was so prophetic that there are multiple fulfillments. There's a fulfillment during his time and then there's also a fulfillment during Jesus' time when he came and then even a greater fulfillment when Jesus comes again. And so while it is possible to assign these titles to an earthly king, I would like to think I stand with the Christian tradition that seeing that these names, the four titles or names that I'm going to share in a short while, really ultimately point to Jesus. Because we as Christians, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven as Apostle Paul terms it. And we come under the refuge of the one who carries the burden of leadership of the government, of his dominion, his kingdom on his shoulders. Now, before I go into these four titles, I want to thank Bishop Gordon and Dr. Maggie Lowe of Trinity College. Both of them were my Hebrew tutors. And so they helped me a lot to improve my Hebrew. And because today's uh, text is so fascinating in Hebrew, I thought I want to spar with them. Huh? So I consulted them, I, I tapped on their brains for insights and ideas, and it's been wonderful uh, sharing this passage with them. <laughs> so refer, refer, returning to the names that Isaiah uses, you will see that Jesus truly is the light we will ever need. Let's look at the qualities. First of all, he's the wonderful counsellor. When I first read it in English, the, I don't know about you, but I always think to myself, first of all, thinking of a counsellor sitting in a beautiful room providing a wonderful listening ear. That's how I read it in English. But actually in Hebrew, it is completely different. It's a completely different imagery altogether. The word used for wonderful, Pele, it means full of wonder. In fact, miraculous, supernatural wonders. 
And the word counsellor, you don't see it in sense of someone listening to you, but rather think of a strategist. Not the therapist, but the strategist providing advice to the king to how to make, in order to make the battle plans. That's the idea here. Idea here. It's a miraculous strategist. A king definitely needs to know how to plan battles in order to win. And so here, Prophet Isaiah declares that God can bring about an astounding victory even in the darkest of days. And I, I was brought to think about, you know, this Chinese movie called Red Cliff, Ci Bi, years ago, but it basically tells the, the story of the, three, the, the battle of the three kingdoms. And in Liu Bei's army, there's this wonderful military strategist, right? Zhu Ge Liang. And this particular scene in the movie, I have that, a clip of that uh, picture of that movie. There's this scene where uh, the, Liu Bei's army has run out of ammunition, arrows, to fight the battle. So what do they do? They build straw men. And they sent it out. And from a distance, the enemy saw these people shaped as men. They started firing the arrows towards them. And so the brilliant military strategies is this. They collected all the enemy's arrows. <laughs> Suddenly, they had full of ammunition to launch the counter-attack. And so the Chinese uh, strategy is called Cao Chuan Jie Jian. Right? Wow, difficult to pronounce. But that's, that's the idea of this military strategy. To borrow the weapons and ammunition from the evil one and then launch the counter-attack. But better than Zhu Ge Liang, Jesus has the best strategies ever. You see, God exists outside of time and space. And if you exist outside of time and space, you have the best bird's eye view. You will definitely best be able to provide the strategy. Think of the greatest chess master you may know. God is more brilliant than that. Think of the most brilliant war strategist. God is even more strategic than him. Think of the best diplomats. God is wiser than all of them. I'm not sure if you need strategies for your own situations in the coming year. Maybe it's a business strategy or a strategy to get out of a very tricky work or family situation. You're trapped in the corner. Now turn to Jesus. He's not just brilliant, but He is a miracle working God. His strategy includes miracles which cannot be done humanly. Jesus can turn every dark situation around. If only all the world leaders will turn to Jesus as their strategic leader for the miraculous strategy to truly bring about a world that is built on justice and righteousness, then can there be true peace. The political situations are, in our world today are as dark, as hopeless as in the days of Isaiah. And that's the good news for all of us. That we can come to Jesus to bring light in our world. In the larger context of Isaiah's prophecy, it also reminds everyone, the listeners, including us, that God is our only source of hope. King Ahaz at the time, he turned to political allies, to turn to the Egyptians, so and so forth, to defend himself. But God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, don't look at political allies. These people will not save you. The people on the ground were turning to temple mediums, consulting the dead. And again, Isaiah says, don't do that. These things will not save you. There is only one way that you can find true salvation. There is no one you can depend on except God's chosen Messiah. Then the prophet uses the imagery of Median's defeat. This account is recorded for us in Judges chapter 7, verses 22 to 25, where Gideon defeated the hordes of Midianites and broke their oppressive yoke. This story, you remember, right? So Gideon at first had a large army, but God said, no, I don't need so many. Slowly, slowly trimmed down, eventually to 300 men. And with 300 men, they defeated an entire Midianite horde. Here I have a picture, courtesy of the British Museum, of an ancient tablet depicting the kind of boots that warriors were used to wear to, used to, wear to battle in those days. And Isaiah says, these warrior boots that you see, they shall no longer be used for war. They shall be used as fire, fuel, for the fire. They shall be burned. And that symbolizes the end of conflict. Isaiah's prophecy was first fulfilled in uh, 701 BC. And 2 Kings chapter 19 records 30, verse 35 records for us how the Assyrian king had Jerusalem under siege. And then an angel of the Lord arrived and struck down 185,000 Assyrians in one night. The Lord had miraculously sent a plague, a terrible plague that killed all of them in one master stroke of strategic Brilliance. That's what God is capable of in one moment to turn an entire situation around. The full fulfillment took place by 612 BC. The city of Nineveh fell and the Assyrians were completely defeated 
by the Babylonians. So that's God, the miraculous strategies. Second title given to God is the mighty God. The Hebrew word gibor means warrior, actually, a warrior, a king that leads army against the en- uh, leads his army against the enemies. Picture yourself living in ancient times when wars were common, right? Not like now we have nation states and so on and so forth. In those days, they were always at war. Who would you want as a king? You want a king who is strategic, right? Able to plan, know how to uh, marshal the army strategically to win the battle. But you also want a king who will go out there and lead and fight the battle like King David did. He will go out there and lead the charge to fight. And that's exactly how Isaiah saw it, that God is like that, who is not just a brilliant strategist, but also a mighty warrior who will go out there to fight for, on behalf of his army. The word El in Hebrew means God. And so if it's applied to a human figure, obviously the human figure cannot be God himself. And so the, the, the best Hebrew way to translate it is a divine warrior. I was chatting with uh, Justin Chan, uh, the local preacher, right, about my interpretation of this passage. I said to him, originally my, uh, I wanted to use the words hero, champion, to describe this mighty God. But then he joked and he said, these words reminded him of his army sergeants using those words uh, very sar- sarcastically. Hey, champion, come here. You're trying to be a hero, is it? Ah, then after that, I decided I don't want to use these two words anymore. <laughs> but actually, that's the idea of Gibor. It's a hero, the victor, the champion. But I decided to stick with divine warrior. Right, divine warrior. You see, in the ancient world, human rulers like to think that they are divine or at least linked to the divine. And this is quite a common thing in the uh, ancient world. But the reality is that no human king, as much as they claim to be related to the divine, can really be said to be God, except Jesus alone. And I think, therefore, the best translation at the end of the day is still mighty God. God, the mighty God. But let's focus on this imagery of a divine warrior for a minute. Most of us, we have this picture of Jesus coming as a lowly servant, slave, right? Especially on Christmas Day, surely he came as a low, humble baby born in the manger. But let's not forget, there's another imagery of God in the Bible. A completely different imagery. For example, in Revelation 1. And it says that the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. This is a glorious image of God. And we mustn't forget that God is actually like that in His full brilliance. If you happen to be doing your soap reading today, Revelation 17, it says also God is the conquering King, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Whatever the beast tries to do, God is going to defeat this army. And so we have here these two first titles, the mighty God and the brilliant, miraculous strategies. The, what I like about this Hebrew text, and that's why I consulted Bishop Gordon as well as Dr. Maggie in the first place, is that this, the way this Hebrew is written, there is an alternative translation that bridges the first two names of God into one sentence. And this is how the Hebrew Bible scholars would translate it. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given, authority has been settled on his shoulders, he has been named, the mighty God is planning grace. The mighty God is planning grace or planning wonders. The eternal father, a peaceable ruler. Taken from Isaiah chapter 9, in this case, uh, verse 5, their numbering is slightly different in the Hebrew Bible. TNK, by the way, stands for Torah, right, the first five books of Moses. Nevi'im, which are the prophets. And, ta- and Ketuvim, K, stands for uh, writings. So the, the Old Testament is basically categorized differently from the Jewish point of view. So come back to my main point here. He's trying to say that the mighty God is planning grace. So the mighty God is strategizing miracles. And that's why scholars debate, how many titles are there (laughs) given to God? Some people like here says three titles. The mighty God is planning grace. Most English translations like NIV or ESV all put four titles, which are common. I know of preachers who have preached five titles given to God. It's possible to go up to six titles as well based on the way the Hebrew is written. And that's why it's a very fascinating text uh, in Hebrew to study. But we come back to this. The point is that the mighty God plans, strategizes miracles. 
He's able to turn every dark situation around. I think immediately of two examples, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. We think of Joseph in the Old Testament. His brothers betrayed him, sold him off as a slave. He thought that's the end of his life. But God will eventually turn that whole situation around. He became the second highest man in Egypt and preserved an entire people, not just of Egypt, but his entire family from the famine. And so God turned that evil situation around for good. Joseph testifies what you meant for evil, God meant it for good to preserve his people. Then I think of Jesus in the New Testament, the Gospels, what Satan did, what sinful human beings did to send Jesus to the cross thinking, ah, that's the end of this you know, guy trying to be a great prophet. Let's kill him. But God turned it around and to redeem his people, to be the true saviour of the world. In all these instances, we see that evil thought that they had won, but little did they know that they're just mere pawns in God's strategic scheme of things. Every human being actually are just mere pawns in God's strategic view of things. So friends, again, are you in the valley of the deep death shadow? If that's you, hear the good news. Not only is God the good shepherd in Psalm 23 walking beside you, he's also the miraculous strategist. He's also the Lord of angel armies. He is the one who will fight for us and turn every dark situation around miraculously through His glorious light. The phrase Lord of Angel Armies is also something that comes from the Old Testament, Lord of Hosts. Typically, we think of angels as very nice, right? Cutesy angels. But actually, if you read the Bible, most of the time when people encountered the angels, as we have also, uh, Thomas read for us earlier, not just were people terrified because of the glory of the Lord shining around them. I think most of the time, they actually they were dressed in army attire <laughs> because they fight. The angels are always warring against Satan and the evil forces. Would you wear your home clothes to go and fight battle? <laughs> right? So that's why it's scary. If you see an angel for the first time, of course, some angels have many eyes, many things. Lah, so of course, quite scary looking. But in general, they are not, you know, pacifists. God fights our battles. But let's move on to the final two names applied to Jesus. He says he's the everlasting father. Straightforward translation, but it really refers to God's unchanging nature and his promise to always love unconditionally as a father would all the days of our lives. And not to us only as individuals, but really to everyone, all generations, all people. He's a father, especially to the poor, the needy, to the orphans, to the slaves. That's what a good king is supposed to be, right? A good king is supposed to be a father for his people. And that's the imagery here. Many of us are familiar with Luke 15, where Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son, or as Tim Keller calls it, the parable of the prodigal God, the God who loves forever and ever and ever, regardless of whatever sin and wrong we have done, He continues to love us. So we're familiar with the passage. So I thought I want to share a modern day, real true story of Dr. William Wan and how his love as a father, his, uh, the wife's love for their daughter continues to stand despite the challenges uh, dealing with their second daughter. <clears throat> so Dr. William Wan, today he's the face and soul of the Singapore Kindness Movement. But he, in, years ago, he had uh, <clears throat> this terrible journey as a father. His middle uh, child, a daughter, brought him the most heartache. But what was surprising to them was that initially in the growing up years, there was nothing that would tell them that one day she would turn her back on the family and everything that they taught her. As a child, she was winsome, adorable. She was very popular in school. Everyone liked her. And then he says, he and his wife, they were never controlling. They gave the children a lot of room to think for themselves. Their responsibility was to read to them the Bible, pray with them every night. In, their teens, in her teens, the family moved uh, to another state in the US and the daughter was sent to the best high school in the district. She was in the gifted program. Unfortunately, at 14 years old, the child fell in with a group who rebelled against the middle class syndrome. Her grades started to fall. She missed school and the school called, us, called them out for uh, counselling. And the once bubbly and chatty child was replaced by a sullen teen who wore black lipstick, shaved half her head, tied the rest of the hair uh, in rainbow hues, had many piercings on her ears. All these are found on Salt and Light. You can read the testimony for yourself. And so she had chosen basically a punk lifestyle. 14 years old. <laughs> and then to cut the story short, <clears throat> on the morning of her 16th birthday, her daughter asked to leave home. 
She told the parents that she's now legally an adult and she wanted to go back to Canada to live on her own. <laughs> she told the parents, it's not your fault, it's just me. I know you care for me, but I have to find my own way to grow up. So for months after that, Dr. Wan's wife, Ruth, would go to their daughter's room and cry, plagued by guilt, wondering if they had done enough or not done enough. Why were things the way they were? And he said, they just had to trust God. We couldn't be where she was, but God is there. You get your knees, <clears throat> you pray, you commit all to God. And this went on for three years. <clears throat> One day when the daughter was 20 years old, she called her father to tell her that she was pregnant. And then she asked him to officiate at her wedding. What will you do? This is your daughter, obviously unwed, right? Pregnant at 20 years old, five months pregnant. <clears throat> he said he agreed <clears throat> to conduct this civil wedding for them. Of course, he made it clear to her that her chosen lifestyle is not consistent with the Christian teaching. And so it has to be a civil ceremony. So he says, I honoured her, but I did not honour her lifestyle. It was not something that they wanted for their child, but he went through with it anyway because it's the father's heart for his daughter. <clears throat> their daughter was five months pregnant at the wedding and most of the guests were teens high on drugs. Wow, very difficult. But what should have been a low point in their journey with their daughter turned out to be a blessing in disguise, a term that Dr. Wan used. Within three years, the marriage fell apart and that was when she told her parents she realised they had been right all along and all that she wanted was to make them happy again. It was a seven years wait, but eventually this prodigal daughter returned. Now, all of us as parents, we have this deep affection for our children, no matter how far they have fallen or strayed. Our hearts continue to cry for them, to long for them. Over the 12 years here at Amokyo, I've prayed with some of you for your wayward children to return, for your wayward children to return to the Lord. And I hope you hear this message of hope again in Isaiah's declaration, proclamation. God is the Father forever. He will always love unconditionally. He loves our children, our grandchildren even, way more than all of us. And with that, we come to our final title, the name given to God, the Prince of Peace. I don't know about you, certainly I've been influenced by Disney. When I hear the word Prince, I think of a very handsome guy sitting on a white horse, don't have to do very many things, right? Just rescue here and there, most of the time, chilling. But here in the Hebrew, actually, it has this sense of a commander. We call it the book of Joshua. When God appeared to him, he was the commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua asked him, who are you? Are you against us or for us? And the commander of the Lord's army says, neither. I'm neither for you or against you. But if you obey, then I will fight the battles for you. <clears throat> to help you see that Jesus truly is a commander who has authority, I think of Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8, where Jesus actually commands the storm to be still. He didn't snap his fingers, you know. He gave the command, the authority, be still. He rebuked them. There was another passage that says, He rebuked the waves and the winds, and they died down. And that's how he brought about peace. You also need to understand that the Hebrew word peace is not just an absence of conflict, but it really means completeness, wholeness. And so it's not just an emotional sense of peace, which we thankfully as Christians, many of us experience, but the world does not yet experience, and we need to bring this peace out into the world. And so it's not just inner peace, you know, that we're talking about here, but truly wholeness, restoration, and the fullness. And that's the sense of shalom. Do we lack wholeness? Maybe our physical ailments prevent us from experiencing physical wholeness. wholeness. For some of us, maybe it's relational conflict that we cannot find a way through that relational conflict. For some of us, are emotional wounds. And for some of us, there may be circumstantial storms that we cannot seem to, to be able to, to quieten them down. So here, this astounding Christmas message of hope from Isaiah 9. We no longer need to fear death's dark shadows because Jesus, the light of the world, has come. The light has dawned and he will come again in his full glory. At the same time, let's hear that he is our government. We come under the wonderful shelter of his wings. He is the king and as his citizens, we benefit from his kingship. But we must be obedient citizens. He is our miraculous strategist. He can turn even the worst, the most helpless situation around. 
never lose hope. He is also our mighty God, the divine warrior who will fight for us. He is not weak, but strong. He perfectly represents our Heavenly Father. <laughs> He's not just strong and kind, but His heart is always towards us. He is our commander of peace. So whether it's a relational conflict, a difficult situation, or physical ailment, God can speak a word of authority to bring about wholeness, healing. What do you need Jesus for you to, to, to read for you today? I hope you see that Jesus truly is the light, all the light we ever need, because in Him alone, we find all these wonderful qualities. Come, let us pray. Now, family, friends, I'm going to give you a moment just to say your own personal prayers to the Lord. Do you need Jesus to be your miraculous strategist to bring you out of a very tricky situation? Do you need God to be a mighty God for you, that champion for you who will fight your battles? When everyone seems to be against you, you need someone to be on your side. Do you need Jesus to demonstrate unconditional love of the everlasting Father towards you? Do you feel forsaken, thinking that you can never come back home? If that's so, that's a lie. You want to nullify that lie in Jesus' name because the Father is always standing there with His arms open. And Christmas is that wonderful declaration that God has taken that first step to reconcile us. And finally, do you need Jesus to be your commander of peace? to bring restoration and wholeness. Maybe it's one, maybe it's all four that you need. Let's cry out to God. Jesus is all the light we need. Jesus, we look to you once again. Truly, Lord, you are the light of the world. You are the most important light we can no longer see, but yet the most important light that we all need. So show yourself strong once again. Move in our lives. We surrender ourselves to you. Pierce our darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.